Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. We hope that you can hear us. Um, Anthony, do you want to get us get us started? Sure. Um, thanks, everyone, again um, for joining. Um, Reggie, if you could just um, uh, advance the slide to number two. Sure. Um, today's meeting is being recorded. Um, uh, the recording will be posted online following uh, this meeting. Um, all participants um, are in uh, are muted during the presentation section of the meeting. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties, please use the question slash chat pod, um, and we will be here to assist you. Um, next slide. In order to let us know that you'd like to ask a question, you can either insert your question in the question uh, and answer or chat pod rather, um, or use the raise hand feature. You'll find the raise hand um, on the right side of your screen. If you click that raise hand button, we will know that you have a question for us um, and we'll be able to, um, uh, and we'll be able to uh, unmute your line and uh, answer the question. Um, and you'll be able to answer a question rather. Um, so I think that those are all of the beginning housekeeping um, slides. Um, so go ahead uh, with slide four and I'll turn it over to Lindsay. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. We are so glad to have you all here. It looks like we have almost 20 people in, att oh, 20 people in attendance. And um, I think we'll first start with maybe introducing ourselves, those of us who are here from the MBTA and um, the very beginning of our slide included a, an email you might have missed uh, where you can reach all of us at fairs at mbta.com. Um, that's a good place for any questions about this process as well. So my name is Lindsay Heffernan. I am the Deputy Director for Policy and Strategic Planning. Uh, Katie, why don't I hand it to you? Hi everyone, I'm Katie Klugin. Uh, I work on our reduced fare programs, um, most notably the Youth Pass program, uh, which is the MBTA's only means tested program right now. Reggie? Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Reggie Ramos. I'm the Deputy Director of Pilots and Innovation. Over to you, Mike. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Mike McGinn, uh, Manager of Fair Inspection Design. And Anthony? You may want to. Um, enlarge the slide deck so that you know each slide takes up um, the screen if that makes sense turn to presenting mode and this is anthony thomas manager of policy development and outreach for the mbta okay well while we get to um we work on that um some context here for those on the call. Um, uh, as Katie mentioned, she manages some of our reduced fare programs because we do have reduced fare programs. Um, and uh, some of those programs you can you can see in this in this graphic. Um, um, I think Reggie, you just want to go to slideshow. There you go. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Reggie. Um, so. Uh, we have programs for younger people. Um, obviously, children don't have to pay a fare if they're under 11. Uh, we have programs, student, student passes with many um, schools in the greater Boston area. Our youth pass program, our only current means tested program, but for individuals up to age 25. And then there's this gap um, uh, in, in many ways um, for uh, non disabled adults. We have programs for those who are disabled, and we have programs for seniors um, to have a re reduced fare. On the MBTA. But if you are between the ages of 26 and 64, we currently don't have the opportunity, even if you are low income, to offer you a reduced fare. It's something that many of us at the T and those of us on this call have been trying to uh, wrestle with and figure out how, how to go about uh, designing and implementing such a program. And we are at a point in time where we need some help and we need some, some new ideas uh, in terms of how to get this off the ground. We know also um, the reality is that. While we've been working on this for well over a year, um, that the region is currently facing increased economic pressures due to COVID and uh, the 
the number of individuals who could benefit from such a program is only increasing. Uh, I think most recent data suggests we'll continue to increase through at least this calendar year um, before we start to see any sort of economic rebound in the area. So certainly timely uh, and, and important, and we really appreciate you all being here. Reggie, if you could go to the next slide. When we look at, uh, this is a, a map of community, community municipalities, it's as of May 2nd, so it's, it, is, it is a little out of date, um, but uh, you can find it through the Pioneer Institute uh, looking at unemployment rates. And obviously in the greater Boston area, you see the more pink, the higher the unemployment rate. Um, but uh, there is lots, lots of communities that are in our network, certainly our bus and rapid transit network, but also for us, some of these pink bubbles that are farther out from the city are many of the nodes that touch the ends of our commuter rail line, whether it's in Worcester, um, in Brockton, and some of our other um, important gateway cities. We know uh, we're not expecting, as I said, a, an employment recovery for, for you know, at, least a, at least 18 months, but who knows? Um, <laughs> uh, and a lot of our partners in state programs are seeing you know, the increases in application for benefit programs. We don't know how many of those people would benefit from an MBTA reduced fare program, but uh, as we're, we're anecdotally, we're seeing that the, the riders who have stayed on transit are essential service riders. Um, and so those are the folks who do rely on our service and did not, and we, we don't believe likely have another mode of, of transport. So uh, all of the, these things are very much interrelated. When we think about our, our big questions for an MTF means tested fares at the MBTA, we wanna give it an acronym before we even begin. Um, what we know, just to put this in context, is that many other transit organizations across uh, North America are trying to figure out how to implement uh, lower income fares. And some are in pilot stages, some are still in design stages as we are, and some have begun um, implementation and are in the first year or two generally of, of their program. Um, there are a couple different things that we need to consider and we put them into two really big buckets. How would we run a program? Because the MBTA doesn't currently function like a social service agency. So in terms of having a, a network hub of how would people get cards in their hands? How would we do outreach and let people know? What about when um, individuals lose their cards? How would, who, who's gonna help with that? And then there's also programs. Um, that also the big question of course is how much is it gonna cost? Some of the questions, answering some of the first questions will help us figure out some of the second questions so that they're not completely separate. They're not, we can easily tease them all out. Um, the revenue, the, the program costs, we, we break down in terms of revenue. The MBTA does pre-COVID, um, generated significant fare revenue every day from 1.2 million trips um, made where people are paying a fare. So when we make fares, um, less expensive, uh, that does have a revenue imp implication for the MBTA. We also know that there are administrative costs for both the MBTA, for us to stand up and have a, a well-functioning back-end um, system as we're trying to build and improve our technology. Uh, that has costs for us. And we know that there are administrative costs for partners. Um, so what are the different funding mechanisms that could help us here? It's important for me to state, I think it's on an upcoming slide as well, we don't currently have a funding um, stream identified. Uh, in other jurisdictions, that has at times looked at, um, we've, they have seen either tax revenues and sometimes dedicated tax streams. They've seen benefactors come forward to start these programs and at least pilot them and improve their viability. Um, but um, um, I just, can everyone still see me? I just lost it, there you go, okay. Um, but. Uh, there is, uh, at this state, this point in time in Massachusetts, it's just important to note that we don't yet know where the money is coming from, but we're trying to make sure the community has a complete appreciation of the total cost so we can make a decision. Um, is, is this a program that's worthwhile for uh, greater Boston residents and, and worth the investment? So what uh, you're looking at on this slide is the eligibility protocols and, and different partnership models. So uh, we have thought a, a lot about this, but we need some help here. Uh, we explored the idea of um, state partners, and that's one way we certainly could, could do this, whether it's partnering with a large state organization um, that's, uh, that could help us um, and really roll this program out. We also have um, thought about municipal partners. Our current Youth Pass program does uh, base, its, base, its, base our work on municipalities for outreach and verification, so individual communities decide to partner with us. Um, 
that has some scalability challenges for us, uh, given we're in 170 communities across Massachusetts. So that's difficult uh, when you include our community network to have everybody participate. Um, so the regional nonprofit uh, model is what we're seeing other jurisdictions also look at that make that our uh, folks who are already in the community that are trusted community providers, uh, allowing individuals to come and enroll or use whatever other interfaces they have, whether it's online applications or over the phone or other programs that they may be enrolling individuals in is a model that we have been encouraged to explore more deeply. Uh, and that's really what got us to the challenge. Uh, what we do know is that um, our board, we are, um, the MBTA is run by the Fiscal Management Control Board uh, who oversees all of our work, have encour encouraged us to use a program-based eligibility for ease of implementation. So rather than looking at doing income-based, that we could pick a program, a, a, a SNAP, a fuel assistance, a, a free and reduced lunch. There's many to choose from um, and take an, take eligibility programs and use those as a, as a threshold. So if you, we also think it helps us to communicate to the public. If you're eligible for X, then you may be eligible for Y, this new program through the MBTA. If you could go forward a slide. When we think about um, important background for folks about our system, our current uh, FAIR technology is a little, um, it's got some, some um, unique features. We're in the process of upgrading those, but it is a many year process. And so based on what we have right now, if we were to try to pilot or begin a program uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future, at least for the future next few years, uh, we run on a card-based system. And so those who provide our system are probably familiar with a Charlie card. And uh, the way uh, reduced fare programs work is individuals are provided cards that are pre-encoded that when you apply money to the card and then you tap the card for use and access to a, to a vehicle or to a station, uh, it removes only half of the fare expense. And so uh, your, your traditional subway fare is then removed at, a, at half of the rate. So getting the cards into the hands of the program recipients is, is some of the real challenge here. So making sure that the right cards get to the right person. We maintain a record of who has those cards and who they've been assigned to. And we are able to remotely deactivate the cards. So if um, Lindsay Heffernan showed up at a program, I showed my proof of eligibility based on some other um, enrollment in a state or federal benefit program. And I was given a card. Uh, if I then called and said, oops, I've lost my card we are able to remotely go in based on knowing that Lindsay Heffernan got card 1234 and deactivate card 1234. We are not able to, however, when Lindsay calls back half an hour later and says, I found it in my couch, we cannot reactivate card 1234. We would have to provide a new card to them. And that's just a limitation of our current technology. We hope that would change in, in a future state, but it's not how, where we are today. Um, the other uh, piece of our, um, our fare system is on commuter rail. And commuter rail is the um, one system where people have access to a mobile app um, and is uh, frequently used. It's called M-Ticket. M-Ticket allows riders to um, purchase tickets and passes, but it doesn't allow transfers to other systems. So people who wanna use the commuter rail system, let's say, uh, wanna live in Worcester, commute into Boston and, and use potentially a reduced fare program, probably are gonna use an M-Ticket on the commuter rail but would also likely need a card because they're gonna then get to South Station and need to get from South Station to wherever their potential work site is. Uh, and that would be then using either our bus or, or subway network. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Reggie Ramos in just a second here. What we where, where we have gotten in our research, and I will say we have, we have done an extensive amount of research, particularly on the fair revenue loss in the fall, much of which we've kind of had to throw out the window uh, because of the, as anyone who's been reading the Globe knows, our ridership has gone down dramatically uh, in, our, in the COVID world. Um, we are released a challenge to a community-based organization seeking information about how we could develop a workable partnership to either pilot and or hopefully in some future state scale, a means-tested fare program to cover the entire MBTA service system. So uh, whether we're interested in thinking about bus, about our um, rapid transit system, which is our, our subway, red, orange, um, blue, and green lines, uh, certainly the silver line too, but also commuter rail um, and, and even ferry. <laughs> so our network is vast and 
Uh, we would like to make this available, program available to everybody um, in, a, in a future state. The purpose here really is to co consider how we can learn from potential partners, um, really including those, those nonprofit and community-based agencies about what might work on their end, because uh, so we don't make assumptions that we're really not in a good position to um, uh, understand exactly how eligibility works. So, Reggie, why don't I turn it over to you for what's in, in the challenge? Sure. Um, as some of you might have already like skimmed through the challenge that's posted on our website. We have nine considerations or what I'd say are nine elements of what we expect or hope to have in the responses that will be submitted. These nine considerations are not meant to be super exhaustive. You may add, supplement other elements that you think are necessary depending on the nuance of your organization. Uh, I'm just going to go through through them quickly and leave some more room for question and answer, but I just want to articulate what each element or what each consideration actually looks like from our end and what we're hoping to derive out of each element. Again, this is purely like um, a, you know, an infor a way for us to gather more information, more data of what's out there, what you folks have been doing in this regard, because I'm sure some of you have more experience in ful fulfilling social benefits. So let me just go through them one by one and um, we'll leave some room for questions later. Client intake channels. So for this section, our expectation is like for, for a response to enumerate to us how uh, potential participants um, of the program will be taken in, whether it's an in-person um, uh, detail or online. I, I suppose because of COVID now would be, it would be heavily online or we could do both. Um, existing physical locations or what they call brick and mortar locations would also be very um, opportune so that we're able to see if which areas um, can be serviced or are already um, have sufficient support for this rollout. Income verification. So this program heavily relies on verification and recertification. So we there is a hope that our potential partner or partners will have this experience of verification and will have the ability to um, verify uh, the eligibility of potential um, recipients. Um, it would help if the current experience of providing verification services is articulated in the response. Um, whether you need technical integration with uh, state partners would also be appreciated if that is stated in the in the response. And um, a, a discussion on how you, an organization or potential partner would um, uh, seek to tackle to tackle recertification eligibility. Partner resources. This would uh, would be a section for you to define uh, uh, your data, your per, your existing personnel resources data. They can refer to data system infrastructure, accessibility and capabilities. Enough to show us or to inform us of your current capabilities and resources to carry out roll out a pilot of this product or a full-on scale um, roll out of the means tested pairs. The next section would be enrollment and fulfillment mechanism. Uh, on this section the, the hope is for an outline of components which you think your organization can handle and which components are best handled by the MBTA. We did have an initial thought we do have an initial thought of what we think it should look like, it might look like, but this is more of a suggestion that we're throwing out there. Um, your experience in delivering uh, products like these are similar to the means tested fairs. It's definitely most appreciated. You can comment on these structures or division of tasks that we've created on here, but I just wanna highlight that we've categorized, if you look at the bottom of your screen, we've categorized um, the what we feel are the the crucial elements of of delivering or fulfilling uh means tested fares there's scoping there's eligibility and opt-in the intake and card issuance um the ability to deal with lost cards and provide customer support and evaluation so this is again this is just um 
an initial thought that we develop internally from our conversations with potential partners and stakeholders. Um, again, according to the nuances and different um, circumstances of your organization, you're free to comment or add or take away if there you have another way of doing things that are that you deem as most effective. The next, I think, a, a crucial piece of the success to a means-tested affairs is a a uh, the ability to uh, show um, whether you have the a potential partner or partners have the ability to um, to deal with case management, um, whether they have income verification tools and how they store data and how they're they wish to support customers in uh, the rollout of this project. Fiscal implications. Um, we know that the, rolling out the project as ambitious as the means tested pairs will require some cost on both the MBTA and our potential partner or partners. So we would like coming from me from those who will respond to our challenge, we would like some idea of um, how much it would cost to administer a means-tested program, means-tested fares program with us, and how this might look like, and what are, and how this cost can be attributed. Um, another thing that we want to see and responses, and that we hope to see, is a timeline and project schedule. If you feel if a particular response uh, deals with the pilot, how long will the pilot be? When can we launch the pilot? How how long will the intake be? And all of these, as you deem fit according to the resources that a respondent may have matched with that of the MBTA. Monitoring and research. Um, it would be extremely helpful if this endeavor is also matched with the data gathering capacity of our partners. What does this mean? Um, it means that um, you can state in your response how you can gather data in the distribution and fulfillment of, of means-tested fares. For example, if you have the capability at what stage um, you could ask beneficiaries um, where they're going, for instance, and how are they using their cards. These are indicators that would tell us how the success rate of the program and how it can best be improved and last but not the least again this is not meant to be an exclusive list you can articulate and expound more but we would like a short exposition if you will of the benefits and limitations of how the administration is proposed so please highlight the benefits of doing a versus B and the limitations of doing A versus B and and try to create a, a picture or a you know an, uh, a more comprehensive high level look at how, how uh, your A response is the best way to go about the rollout of means test affairs. Um, we've posted this on our website, and I'm sure you folks have seen it, but for any questions, please write us at fairs at mbta.com. We are expecting the first round of submissions to be done to the end of July. And um, yes, we should be taking, if you guys, if you folks have questions, we, will, we are happy to take them. Thanks, Reggie, and thanks, Lindsay, for the presentation. Um, so we do have a couple questions that we've received both through the uh, questions pod, um, and I see also at least one um, raised hand. Um, so what I'll do is I'll uh, first unmute the raised hand, which is from Louise Baxter. You should be able to speak now. Oh, no, I, 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 my, my raised hand's a mistake. Oh, okay, no worries. We um, always I love having you here, Louise. Thank you. Hi, Louise. <laughs> Okay, I will move on to um, a question from the question and chat, uh, question and answer pod. Um, this question is from Andrew Jennings. Many of the areas of high unemployment identified on the Pioneer Institute map are cities where the bus service is provided by one of Massachusetts RTAs, not the MBTA. 
What efforts are being undertaken to coordinate this program with the adjacent RTAs? It's a um, really good question. Can everyone hear me? I'm unmuted. Thanks, Reggie. Uh, yes. It's a re really good question. And um, I think at this point in time, the MBTA has been, I would say, at the um, at the earlier stages of this. I think uh, for those who are familiar with the financing for the MBTA and the RTAs, it, it does look pretty different in terms of our fair revenue um, and fair box recovery ratios. Uh, it would be amazing to get to a place where this was an integrated model. Um, but I think we are at the place where we're trying to trying to figure out how we could pilot something. Um, but obviously, when you think of uh, first and last miles, uh, just getting people to a station in a city when they also maybe are struggling to get home, I appreciate you're pushing the, pushing us to to think even more deeply about about how to get there. Um, but we are we're, we haven't made significant progress or, or inroads on on that as of yet. Uh, happy to take another question on, on that, but um, I think the T is trying to begin as the largest provider, obviously, um, in the in the region, and hope that we could get to a place where we could grow in, in a future state. Great, thanks, Lindsay. Um, the next question is from Susan Backstrom. Um, this question is related to um, uh, other different other types of programs that um, recognize poverty um, through social service agencies like DTA. Um, and the question is, why aren't those programs easily accessible, or excuse me, easily accessed and monitored by the MBTA? Well, I think uh, if I understand the question correctly, the, the, what is being proposed, let's say, you know, I'm Lindsay Heffernan who works at the MBTA and Reggie Ramos receives SNAP benefits through DTA. And the model here is, um, I think what you're asking is, could we build a model where the MBTA knows and can maybe like see into the um, data of DTA in order to know that Reggie Ramos is receiving benefits. Um, and so that, um, that given current some current privacy laws and the way that uh, current state agencies are functioned, the MBTA is a quasi independent. So we're certainly not part of health and human services, let alone uh, directly tied to DTA. They have lots of sensitive information about people and their not only their income, but uh, disability status and other such things uh, potentially. And so we don't currently have that sort of capability. Um, could that exist in the future? Um, that, that's certainly possible. Um, you know, larger data sharing agreements are complex and sometimes hard for state agencies to work out. They are definitely possible. Um, and it's something that I think we could explore. I think in some ways we're trying to prove um, a proof of concept and then figure out what's the right method. Is that where we should expend our energies to get a, a data share with the Department of um, Transitional Assistance or other um, you know, larger benefit provider? Or should we go a different model that is a little more localized um, and not spend what could be a many, many year long process in order to build such a, a data transfer system? I hope that's responsive. And Reggie, I don't know if you want to add more, but Certainly, please add add more to your question if I if I didn't do it justice. No, I think we Thank covered you. everything. I just, sorry, I just want to call out that we have two handouts that's been prepared. So if you click on the on the screen, it has two handouts, which is the challenge and what's the other one? And these slides. We have a copy two. of these of these slides. Oh, the slides. Okay. All right. Great, thank you. We'll also be posting those um, on our website following the meeting as well. Um, Anthony, one other question. Is this recorded? Yes, this is being recorded, correct. So we can post a copy of the recording as well for those if you want to share it with others. Please do. <laughs> um, the next question is from Gray Black. Um, the question is, do you have a preferred method for submission? PowerPoint, record, graphics, et cetera. They're all welcome, as long as it's clear, concise, and covers all or most, or even additional considerations, they are all welcome. Provided that it's clear and we're easy, easily accessible to us, sure, why not? Great, thanks, Reggie. Um, the next question is from um, Felipe Zamberlini, um, and that is a live question, so I'm gonna go ahead and unmute your line, Felipe. Hi folks, thank you all so much um, for the presentation. 
Um, my name is Felipe. I'm the public policy director at Rosie's Place. I'm one of the first time to invite you for having come also before uh, to Rosie's Place to discuss a little bit more about the AF2C pro, AF2 program, AFC 2.0 program, um, and you know really listen to the, the concerns that we would have, especially with how the programs would impact um, homeless women in the community. Uh, so I think first and foremost, it's a comment, uh, and then I have a question. Uh, the first comment is around inclusivity. Um, I think I, I, I get the, the balance you know, trying to figure out localization versus going to, towards a broader system. I would, I would argue that the broader system will be able to include more people, especially um, when I think about undocumented immigrants who are hard workers in our communities. They're not getting SNAP. They might not be getting some of these benefits that we're thinking about, but they might have mass health standard, right? The very basic. And so you're gonna have to consider finding ways to make this work in a broader categorization so that this can actually work. Otherwise, if there is too many limitations, you're gonna end up with a program that kind of ends up like the youth pass. That's you know a good model, um, but because there's so little state investment in it and so little systems to really help allow the MBTA to really outreach to as many people as possibly could, it ends up having a lot more struggles to be able to be successful than it does. And so, as we all know, the legislature likes to see success rates, like to see things working in order to fund them better. So I would I would argue that um, you guys should really be thinking about the broader scope, as broad of a scope as you can possibly go with. Um, and then the, here come my, my, my question out essentially. So understanding that the verification that you're looking for currently with this proposal to have, that I read both from the previous presentations that, you, that were given to um, the Fiscal Management Control Board, it seems like the focus really has been on programs that are run by the state. But that also might leave a few people behind, not only undocumented immigrants, like I mentioned, but from our perspective, women experiencing homelessness. Not all of them have SNAP. Not all of them are on cash assistance. Not all of them are families. There's a lot of individual women who we serve at Rosie's Place that might end up falling through the cracks because there just isn't a government assistance service that really cares for them, and they are left behind. So I would encourage you all to think and ask actually, have you thought about how to integrate the services with other verifications, uh, such as either self-verifications that have some kind of qualifier um, or perhaps even verification from direct service providers that you could say that are trusted and that you can perhaps even sign contracts with like the shelters. Uh, so that would be the question. And if there hasn't been a thought, I would encourage that to be some kind of a thought. Do you wanna go ahead first, Reggie? Yes. So, hi, Felipe. Thank you for asking that question. So, that's ex exactly what we are looking for in some in in the responses that we are expecting by the end of July to also articulate um, those that are not the marginalized that are not captured. Muted. Oh. Unmuted. Sorry, folks, I think we had a little technical difficulty and we all got muted, even presenters. Okay, here we go. So I got cut off. I don't know where, but let me start over. Thank you, Felipe, for that really good question. These are exactly, you know, uh, this is exactly what we're looking for in the responses that we're expecting by the end of July to help us see through the process and uh, surgically you know, identifying ways for us to seek the most marginalized um, and those who have been, uh, uh, the, those are who are deprived of transit and mass transit because of their personal or or societal situations. So, uh, I would encourage those who would file uh, responses to include the element that Felipe had just um, discussed. And there's another, there's a. Um, Yes, immigrants have figured in much of our uh, discussions with uh, potential partners, with stakeholders, and they, this is this is uh, centrally uh, uh, in place in all the discussions, Felipe. Um, I, 
there was another element to his question. There were two. It was a two prong question. Yeah, uh, I think Lindsay. I think the other the other piece, Felipe, that is a, I really do appreciate your question, and I'd like Reggie, encourage you to get us responses. In some ways, we're also trying to use responses to generate to drive more interest um, across outside of the MBTA for why this is important. So. Um, uh, in terms of other ways for people to enroll in programs, I think we had traditionally thought of the either you sh you know you show your proof of eligibility in a program like a SNAP and I'm, or, or, or even a Mass Health standard and uh, or pick others. I understand um, fuel assistance. I think it doesn't have to be the immigration or not the same immigration connotation um, that some other programs have. But I suppose for somebody who's homeless, fuel assistance is not is not a helpful metric. Um, so. The notion that you're saying that we should both have eligibility by program and maybe a second other way to do um, verification. And we were initially thinking about that as income verification, but you're suggesting something novel to us that maybe what we should also be thinking about is a network of trusted partners uh, who can say, you know, Reggie Ramos maybe doesn't have a W-2 stub to show us what's going on, but I hear as a um, you know, program administrator at Rosie's place or whoever, um, um, I'm in a position to say she could really benefit from this kind of program. I don't know what that would do to the scale and size of our program, but I, I love the creative thinking, and that's exactly what we're looking for to help us figure out how do we capture the people who really need this um, at, at this point in time. So thank you, and please ask more if that if, if we didn't if we raise your hand again <laughs> uh, if if we if there's more to say on that. Thank you, Lindsay and Reggie, and thank you, Felipe, for your your uh, your question. I do remember that visit to Rosie's place, and it was very nice to learn from you all. So um, I'm glad that you're still connected with the uh, the goings on at the MBTA. Um, just a reminder to folks that if you have additional questions, you can submit them via the questions pod or raise your hand to be unmuted. Um, currently, we have a um, a follow up from Susan Back uh, Backstrom. Um, uh, which was the uh, question about um, working with DTA to access some of those programs and data. Um, uh, that clarification is the privacy issue seems to be the crux of the matter here in this issue. Um, so Susan has expressed hope that there's an answer to um, that question, um, that we can figure out a solution to that problem. Um, I don't currently have Can I any... add to that? Can I add to that, Anthony? Just, um, I okay. think it's, I think, um we probably could navigate our way around privacy and around privacy issues certainly there are legal mechanisms that we could put in place and data sharing agreements and the like um i think some of it is also a prioritization uh dta uh to uh, stand in their stead if they were here right now we know is seeing an, a real increase in um service need and is trying to, to manage that and so how does this become a thing that, that gets prioritized right standing up a new essentially a new almost entitlement program uh, is, a, is a big ask. And right now the MBTA is thinking deeply about it, but we're, we're hoping that we get somewhat through this process, more people thinking about why this could be important and what it might look like in a future world if such a service were available um, to our um, lower income and higher need individuals across uh, the greater Boston and, and affiliated network. Great, thank you, Lindsay. Um, I don't currently have any um, uh, raised hands or uh, questions in the chat box. Um, so I will just remind um, everyone what Reggie mentioned earlier is that any uh, questions following this meeting can be sent to us at fairs at mbta.com. Um, we are um, uh, expecting first round submissions to be submitted uh, by July 30th. Um, uh, but you know, responders are encouraged to reach out to us um, early and often if necessary. Um, uh, if there are any uh, clarifications that are needed, um, or if there are any um, specific questions um, about our fair technology or things like that, um, we do welcome those conversations, and we do welcome uh, using this as a process to um, uh, engage the this this community um, in helping solve these kind of complicated problems. Okay, well, like uh, Anthony, uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. I encourage you to reach out to us. Um, Reggie, thanks for thanks for joining in here. Uh, and thank you all for for your interest. Um, please be in touch, and uh, we hope we hope we get to see some responses and be more creative and innovative in, in how we reach um, a, a real vulnerable population 
uh, in our community. So thank you all. I, I hope you have a great, great rest of your day. Thank you. All right. Have a great one. Thanks.